everybody, I'm excited to be back. We've had a bit of a break, but it is definitely worth the wait. Today, I am excited to welcome Allison to the Flower Podcast. Welcome, Allison. Hey, glad to be here. Thank you, Scott. So we've had a bit of a break, and I've really been looking forward to this interview for so many reasons. Um, I know uh, one of our sponsors, Farmer Bailey, I saw you on one of his It's 5 O'Clock Somewhere talks on Instagram, and and I said, oh my gosh, I've got to get, I reached out to them, I'm like, I want to have Allison on the podcast, because she has so many amazing experiences and everything. And if you don't follow Farmer Bailey, you need to go do that because he has these great chats with really smart people, including himself, of course, and talking about growing flowers and some of the nuances and experiences. And Allison, I um, can't, I know when we chatted a little bit last week, I was just like, I, I, I like all these people in your path of, in your journey. Um, I'm like, oh my gosh, I know that person. And oh my gosh, I know that. I mean, I was just like so excited to hear. So if you don't mind, let's jump in at the beginning. And how did you find your way into the world of cut flowers? I know, right? It's such a small world and all of the, <laughs> the uh, a small flower world and all of the amazing people that are in it. Um, and how I found my way into uh, the flower world and especially the cut flower world um, was kind of uh, haphazard, which I think most of us can relate to, you know, when it comes to, to plants, which makes, makes this all fun and exciting. Um, but I didn't really find plants until, um, until I went to college. Uh, I grew up in a military family. We moved around quite a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, didn't really get settled on a career path until, um, until college where I went to Virginia Tech. And uh, I decided I was, I had an undecided major at the time. I decided to take a uh, indoor plants class because I was like, oh, cool. This will be great. Like, I'll figure out how to not kill all the plants <laughs> that I have in my house. You know, it'll be right. useful. Um, and ended up just falling in love with plants, learning all the, the Latin names and, you know, what triggered each of them to flower and what conditions they needed to like thrive the best. I was just so into it. I was like, I need to know more about this. So um, I took all the plants classes I could at Virginia Tech and um, ultimately declared a major in biology and a minor in horticulture Okay. because um, I found I really loved the science of it. So just was just trying to take as many plant related classes as I could. Um, one of the, the mentors that I found, um, while in my time at Virginia Tech was, um, Dr. Alan McDaniel, who was the floral design professor. And, um, so I TA'd the floral design. I took the class and then he asked me if I would TA his class. And I did that for about two years. And that's where I found my love of floral design and cut flowers and even did my first vase life test, uh, with, oh, wow. with him. Yeah. And, um, then that's also where I connected with um, Andrea Gagnon, because she was also a Virginia Tech grad, advertised an internship um, in the department. And that professor connected me. He was like, hey, don't you live in Northern Virginia? Um, and so I worked a couple summers on her farm, growing cut flowers, harvesting, uh, selling to the markets in, in DC. And um, it was just amazing to to get that experience and then she connected me with Dr. John Dole at NC State where I went to grad school and studied cut flower production and post harvest so um, I did a master's degree and then ultimately decided to stay on for more uh, pain <laughs> and punishment <laughs> that's exactly um, right yeah yeah uh, to to get a PhD in cut flower uh, post harvest and just studying various aspects behind it of the microbiology and even some of the molecular genetics behind it um and uh, i don't just really came to to love everything about cut flowers the science behind them the growers that need to utilize them and just really the connection between the science and the industry so making sure that you know what we were doing that was really nerdy and technical actually had an application to to growers too and that's where I found my my passion for that. 
Um, and then I did a one-year postdoc at NC State too after I finished my, my PhD and then um, joined Syngenta Flowers, uh, which was kind of a, a gear switch for me because um, I was, I, well, first I was pursuing, um, I was looking for faculty positions at universities when I was graduating, which was also one of the reasons why I wanted a PhD because you need one of those to, to teach right. at universities. Um, but when this opportunity came open at Syngenta Flowers, which is a uh, global flower breeder, so it's the company behind all the new varieties that you see out there in the garden centers and, you know, in your, your vases at home. Um, uh, it was just a really good opportunity to start as a scientist there and working more with, with bedding plants and perennials than cut flowers. But um, eight years later, no regrets. It's been an amazing uh, ride at, at Syngenta, learning all about bedding plants. And then now within the last like three years, uh, being able to really utilize my background in, in cut flowers too, with the, the relaunch of our cut flower assortment. So that's, that's wow, how you I- summed that up really well. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and you, you glossed over so many great things. I, um, first of all, Andrea and Lou are amazing people. What an opportunity to kind of get your feet wet in, in the whole world of cut flowers with them. We'll have to put a link to their past, uh, the episode we had with Andrea yes. in our show notes. So if you've not heard that episode, just scroll down and you'll be able to get that. But so much knowledge, so much experience. Um, and I mean, just a, a hustler of a flower farmer, um, oh, yeah. they are, and that's, that's insane. I know I learned so, so much from her and we still work together now. So she's actually one of, um, uh, my like premier trialing partner for all of our flower genetics and takes the photography, um, of our stuff too. So it's been amazing to like get my start with her and then be able to continue to, to work with her as like a, a collaborator and friend now. That's insane. Well, and plus, I mean, being able to see, I mean, that's got to be great for Andrea because I mean, just being able to kind of see the new releases and see things that are coming up and have her sort of stamp of approval on some of them, or, or at least, oh, yeah. you know, her input is, mm -hmm. is incredible. Well, and, and then I, I feel like we glossed this over too, a little bit. So with, with Dr. John Dole, who I, met many years ago but then got to meet again at the last year's ASCFG conference um which I'm so excited that he's so involved with ASCFG uh if you're not a member of ACFG I would recommend it because this is the kind of information you get uh access to really well is just his research and things but you guys published something that um I didn't know about till I, I mean I, it's just cuz I'm not growing I guess anymore but I didn't know about this until I listened to you and, and Bailey talk the other day. Um, tell us about your little publication. Yeah, so it's kind of heavy, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. So I, I got the opportunity to co-author um, a, a book, uh, Post-Harvest Handling of Cut Flowers and Greens, uh, with Dr. John Dole and several of my other colleagues in the, the cut flower space. And it is definitely the like premier resource for cut flower post harvest um right now i mean there's there's been some, you know there were some tips and tricks in in uh judy and alan's book on, on specialty cuts but uh what we wanted to do with this book was really put it all in one so like the first half of the book is kind of general post harvest handling and like post harvest care how to maximize the vase life of cut flowers in general so it goes over what is ethylene and how to mitigate it why the heck are there 20 different um you know floral preservatives to use and you know all the different companies and you know when do you use which ones and uh, when, why is it, why does it matter at the stage that you harvest flowers, you know, from, uh, from the plant to get the best post-harvest life. So it explains a lot of the, the science behind it and like the theory and techniques. Um, and then the second half of the book 
is broken down species by species, like sunflowers, um, lisianthus, methiola, how to do the proper post-harvest care and handling. So what stage of harvest, what floral preservatives to use, can you put it in the cooler or not, how long you can leave it in there, um, is it sensitive to ethylene or not, you know, and any other research that we could find to put into like each of the kind of mini chapters for each of the species. So it's like we were just trying to gather everything we could um, to put into those um, uh, into those sections. And sometimes we found that there wasn't good information for some some species. So, you know, then it leads to some research ideas. So so that was it was a fun it was a fun, very taxing process. But like now there is an amazing resource that's offered through the ASCFG um, that has, it's, it's, it really is your one-stop shop for, for post-harvest care. Oh, well, that's great. That's a good connection there. We'll have to try to put the link to that somewhere too. I, I, I was going to ask you, where can we get it? And um, should have known, should have known ASCFG would have it. Well, it's, yeah. I, I mean, I just, I've heard nothing but great things about that book. And I'm kind of curious as you guys were, going through the process of writing and researching and all that. Was there anything in particular that maybe stood out with you? Like, wow, I didn't know that. Or wow, you were surprised about something. Um, Cause you know, sometimes you're doing these things and you find these unexpected things along the way. Yeah. I think for me at the time, cause we were writing that as I was like finishing my PhD and like into my postdoc and really just, exploring more of the species that were out there being used as cuts you know I mean I had worked with several like during my time and like at Andrea's and you know with the floral design course and whatnot but there were so many other things that like maybe you know other species that maybe like fell out of fashion and, mm. and like we were putting them in the book and I was like ah oh, this is interesting like I I like Silene I hadn't really done anything with silene in my time up until then, but then after reading about that and like, now I see it more, I don't, it's just way more exposure to all the different specialty species that are out there. So that was, that was one of the cool parts. Well, that's really interesting too, because a lot of times, you know, a resource like this might open your eyes to flowers you haven't grown before. And you're like, oh, well, this would be easy for me to add to what I already do. Cause it's, in line with everything else. So exactly. Um, I think, yep. I think that's great. I, um, okay. So this might be, and, and I'm not trying to dumb this down at all, but I know that when you work for a company, um, like Sagenta flowers, it's, it's kind of like, can I just call them up and buy some plants? And I know the answer to that is no for anybody who might see photographs that we share this week or whatever. And it's kind of like there's a process to it. So can you kind of explain a little bit more like how that system works? Because sometimes we don't realize how major of an international global process this is. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that was like this, the whole kind of industry behind the industry right. of floriculture was something I didn't fully understand until until I went to work for Syngenta Flowers. And so, yeah, this is a, a happy to talk about this because it's really important. So Syngenta Flowers is a breeding company. So we are kind of like the first step in the process of getting a flower to an end consumer, like in uh in a vase on someone's table. So uh, we're an international company that employs breeders, plant breeders who breed new varieties. So we've got breeders in the US, in California, and we've got breeders in um, in the Netherlands and various other kind of independent third-party breeders that we work with too. So we're trying to breed the best and the new and the most innovative uh, like disease resistance, heat tolerance, uh, faster to flower, more floriferous. So we're trying to like breed the best of the best the new stuff to make it easier for growers to grow. And we have whole teams of people behind supporting those breeders. Um, and uh, But then our ultimate product that we sell are the seeds and the unrooted cuttings of those new varieties. So we have uh, farms, uh, in several different locations, depending on what the species is. So we have some in Alva, Florida for our mums, our, our 
cut our cut mums. And then we have some in like Guatemala and Mexico, and then even like over in Turkey and uh, Kenya and just, yeah, a little everywhere. bit of everywhere. Yeah. Depending on, you know, what makes sense for, for the, for the species. And so we sell those seeds and cuttings to propagators and, you know, finish growers, greenhouse growers, and they buy them through a broker. So if, if you're familiar with, um, uh, you know, Griffin or Ball or uh, Express Seed Company, um, they broker our seeds for us. So they're kind of like the middleman wholesaler type model where we produce the product, the brokers sell it to you know, greenhouse growers, cut flower farmers, you know, who, whoever it is that wants to buy the seeds and cuttings. And you can also buy rooted material, um, like how uh, Farmer Bailey uh, sells our, you know, our liners of our mums and you know, all of our various other um, offerings. So that's how our products get out to, to, the, to the world. And where I fit in that um, is, so I'm our head of technical services uh, for all of the Americas region. So North America and South America and Central America. And so my team helps with the technical support. So like if for all the growers and stuff. So if you have questions about growing things, you know, what fertilizers to use, what variety selection, um, we're, the, we're the nerds the nerds of the company. So we're proud. We're proud to be the nerds of the company. So we like talking about plants and how to grow them and the weird things that they do. And so, and to make, to make everyone successful. Well, that, I mean, just that alone, as you say that, and I'm thinking, wow, North America, Central America, South, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of, that's a lot of real estate. It is. Um, how, as far as all the different microclimates that are, that, that entails, um, you really have to be versed in, you know, how to, to juggle all the different nuances of growing in all these conditions, I would think. How, sure. it, how, it definitely how? keeps us employed, Scott. <laughs> it definitely keeps us employed. So, oh gosh. you know, it's just experience and seeing things. And a, a lot of the, I do have, um, it's a 10 member team, including myself. So, you know, we're in, in total, we are a wealth of knowledge. And we also do trialing to figure stuff out. So, you know, that's where our very close connections with our customers comes in is that, you know, we learn from them too. So when we go to visit them and see what they're doing, you know, we learn from them um, probably sometimes more than they learn from us, but it's definitely a, a mutually beneficial uh, relationship. So it's a fun job. You know, I can totally understand that. I know you mentioned moms. Um, for people who aren't familiar with some of the genetics that Sagenta owns, like what are other cut flowers that we might we might know about? Yeah, so um, so we've got the mums, uh, you know, which was how you saw me with the Farmer Bailey uh, yeah. uh, uh, Instagram Live, and we also have. I'm really proud of our dahlia assortment. Um, so if folks might be familiar with the Karma dahlias and also Cafe Ole. Uh, the number one dahlia in North America for a while now here. Um, we have those uh, those varieties offered from unrooted cuttings. So you can actually, rather than starting from tubers, um, we offer them from unrooted cuttings. So you can buy those as, you know, rooted liners from, from Farmer Bailey and various of the other uh, broker companies as well um, as liners to transplant, which, which honestly, Scott, I really love rather than trying to stick it like a big fat tuber in, in a hole and, you know, your plastic or, or just really, it's just so much easier to put those, those liners in, in the field than it is the, the tubers and they're, and they're virus free. So they come from the cuttings come from our farms where all of our annuals, like our petunias and um, caliber coa and, and, and all those bedding plant annuals are produced. So they're, they're clean they're virus free, they're disease free. So it's just a very, um, we, we really pride ourselves on being a, a, a trustworthy supplier. Um, so yeah, yeah. Well, Our that's, yeah, that's, that's an amazing thing because I feel like people don't fully grasp the importance of that, you know, because nowadays with everybody selling things every which way, 
Um, there's not a problem with that, but it's, it's a lot of times there are viruses being spread around and it's like, you know, what an opportunity to just know that it's certified, I guess, if that makes sense. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cause you never know, you never know with plant viruses, how they're going to like get to other plants and what they're really going to do and how they're going to affect your quality. So it's just, it's always good to just start from a trustworthy supplier. And, and that's, that's one of our ultimate goals at Syngenta Flowers. Sure. Now, let me ask this kind of question that I, I've never done very much starting of dahlias from rooted cuttings. Is there any kind of a lag time with that versus tubers? No. So we've done some trials. So at, at Andrea's farm at Linville studios, we, we did some trials and we compared cafe au lait grown from tubers and grown from uh, rooted liners uh, where they were transplanted like plus or minus two days from each other. So within the same week and um, they, they bulked up and they flowered at similar times with, with uh, similar flower quality, uh, productivity, you know, yield, uh, one of the things that we did notice, though, was that with the ones from rooted liners, they were, if you like looked down the row, they were, they were very um, like soldiers lined up. They were very consistent. They weren't like up and down, up and down, like the ones from tubers were. And I think that comes from like, you know, clumps of different sizes yield a different size plant sure. so with starting from a consistent plant material um that was consistent and also we found that uh, the 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 ones from our rooted liners had more of that creamy cafe au lait color i know like we've noticed over the years right. like cafe au lait you know has gotten more pinkish purplish hues to it and we definitely noticed that ours had that the actual au lait of the cafe au lait in it so that was that was actually really cool to see yeah because that's interesting so many times i've heard that people think that's cultural you know either cooler temperatures warmer temperatures fertilizer light shade things like that yeah and there and there is still some component of that involved in the coloration but it wasn't as like drastic um and it wasn't as like consistent so interesting yeah. 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 Cool. Well, I know one of the things that I'm really stoked about because I know last year we've, I've had a few conversations over the last 12 months about mums and mum production. And I'm really thrilled that this is an opportunity, an opportunity to have sort of a resurgence of this crop into our domestic flower farming, because you know, it used to be a huge crop here in the U.S. And when things happened with the various trade agreements and it became cheaper to produce in South America and bring them in, um, it really killed the industry here. But I feel like this is a gigantic opportunity to bring it back. I know I've been thrilled, you know, where I work, um, we've had... Uh, local moms come into the wholesale house and people overwhelmingly have been enthusiastic about them. Um, number one, because a lot of times they offer different colors or shapes or sizes than the traditional South American mom. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious. I mean, I'd really like to kind of unpack this. I don't know if you, if we can do that. Um, yeah. I'd love to just pick your brain on the, uh, of of the growing, like maybe just let's go deep into mums again on the podcast because I just feel like there's, you know, right now it's as we're recording this, it's June fourth, so this is really like on the cusp of like you. I don't even know if you can plant them still this year. So let's talk yeah. about mums. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, so kind of the beginnings of this, cause yeah, the mom production hasn't really been going on so much. You know, there's been some of the really specialty heirloom stuff that's, you know, kind of been, uh, you know, maintained by, you know, folks like King's moms and whatnot. And, but the demand has really out, out has really exceeded the supply that is available from, from these types of suppliers. So uh, myself and um, a few uh, industry friends and colleagues, uh, you know, we were like, 
kind of spitballing how can you can we use can we use pot mums as cut flowers because syngenta flowers is really well known for all of its mums from like garden mums to to pot mums um and because uh, we have the uh, yoder like the old yoder breeding in our our heritage there so just more years than I know of, of mum excellence. So we're like, okay, well, I don't know if it would work or not with the pop mums, but let's, let's see, we've got some good genetics and let's give it a try. I'm always down for a trial. Sure. Um, so we set up some trials and uh, uh, with uh, Harmony Harvest, uh, Jessica Hall in, in here in Virginia, not too far from me, about two hours. And also at Andrea's at Linvale. And, um, and got some mums in the ground um, and uh, it worked, it worked. So just kind of, you know, and it's all about just understanding the biology of the plants. You know, what makes them, what are the environmental cues that make them put on vegetative growth? So put on nodes and stem length. And then what is it that triggers flowering? And with mums, it's actually pretty simple. So long days, uh, keep them vegetative. So like through the summer. So they're stacking those nodes in that stem length. Um, and then when the day length switches, so at the solstice, um, when it switches from uh, at 12 hours, so when days start getting shorter than 12 hours, that's when they initiate flowering. So um, uh and actually now is a really good time to stick cuttings. Um, the ones that Andrea is trialing uh, for, for this year, um, they just got stuck last week. So, so you say stuck, are you talking about like a rooted cutting or the actual cutting that's being rooted? I'm talking the actual like cutting stuck in substrate to be propagated. Oh, so, okay. So not even wow. in the ground yet. Yeah, so sticking, yeah, totally fine. Um, and this is what we did last year and got like almost too much stem length. So we're also going to do a separate, uh, planting that's a little bit later. So we can see where we can manipulate that stem length, um, as well. But, uh, but yeah, so then sticking them now is, is good. I don't know. There's, there's really a stretch of time where you can do it. So, you know, it's kind of easy, easy peasy in that way. Um, and then you plant them in um, a high tunnel is recommended. So it doesn't have to be like in a greenhouse, but a, um, a hoop house or a high tunnel with just some sort of protection over it um, is, is good for the flower quality. Um, also keeping, if you get some like early frosts and stuff, uh, you know, it'll help keep that cold off of them because the cold can initiate them to flower a little bit faster if you have like sustained cold. Um, so it's just kind of keeps some of the chill off. And um, in the ground, Portanova netting or some kind of netting is is definitely recommended because they are like beefy, beautiful, amazing stems. Um, we recommend planting one uh, liner per square of netting. And then so that's like, after what, six inches or. Yeah, six inch space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, then after their you want to pinch them back to five nodes. So once they have like seven nodes on that plant, then you pinch them to five nodes and then, and then you just let them grow. Um, and just keep the bugs off of them. There's, I mean, they're mums, so they have any typical, you know, pests and, and diseases that you want to prevent, but nothing, nothing extensive. Um, and they just grow. And through the summertime, those long days, you know, they're there and they're just stacking nodes. They're stacking that stem length. And doing their thing when the days get shorter they set buds and they flower and you've got flowers from like the end of october through the beginning of november which is a really great time to have local beautiful flowers because there's yeah, especially not moms, a lot going on because i mean moms are traditionally that fall season time plus i mean they have such a great shelf length a shelf life I, i'm Okay, so I'm curious about a lot of things here. Um, I, first of all, going back to this distinction between pop mums versus cut mums, and is there really a difference or is it just how they're cultivated? 
there there's sometimes there's a difference in the species of chrysanthemum that it is like there's definitely a species difference between garden mums and pot mums and sometimes the cut mums are a different species of chrysanthemum uh but but as we know from specialty cut flower production, it doesn't really matter, you know? It's like, as long as you can grow it and get the stem length that you need and a decent base life and it looks pretty and you can use it in fun ways, that's that's what makes it a cut. Well, that's what I always like to say that um, uh, these <laughs> plants can't read. They only know, <laughs> they only know what they, you know, their genetics tell them. So it's kind of like, they're going to do what they're going to do. They don't know they're not supposed to do certain things. So, right. um, I think, I think that's awesome. Yeah, um, that's fine. I, um, do you find, um, when it comes to pinching, I mean, like there's that pinch to help induce branching, Yep. But then I know like being someone who buys a lot of, you know, South American chrysanthemums, um, there's things called disc buds, there's thing, you know, there's all these different things. So do you, do you feel like that people really have to do a lot of disc budding with these things or does it depend on what you're growing? Yeah. So, yeah. So I think it depends on what, on what you want the final look of the stems to be. So um, in all the trials that we've done so far, we haven't done any kind of disbudding. We haven't done any center bud removal to get like more even flower sprays. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. haven't done any lateral bud removal to get like one big bodacious flower in the middle. Um, but we're going to try some of that this year because um, we've still only done this program for two seasons. So Which is crazy to me. Yeah. I so mean, how much you've done in just two years, it's... Uh... Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. So we're going to play around with that. And I think that's what's going to be, what's going to help, um, you know, of course it's more time and like hands on it, but I think that's also going to help distinguish this local material from, uh, you know, some of the offshore material coming right. in. because you know, that flower farmer, you can listen to your customers and like know if they want a spray in that color if, or if they want, you know, a big, beautiful flower in the middle, or maybe they don't care and you just keep your hands off of it. And the, the stems, they look, right. they look fabulous, even if you don't, if you don't disbud them. So um, I think that's where kind of the, the customization and like really knowing your market, knowing your customers uh, comes in with these, which I think is exciting. Yeah, I mean, totally. And the thing is, is, I mean, when you think about where the cup mom industry is right now in the U.S., I mean, you're right. You mentioned Kings and some, you know, that there's some companies that have been around for quite some time and have morphed a little bit here and there. So it's not like it's new, but this enthusiasm for really going wide on this particular genera is 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 relatively new how many varieties right now do you guys are, are you trialing for cup production i have to qualify that because i know there's way many more that you're going yeah. for other things yeah so we have actually trialed um our entire pot mum assortment as cut flowers and that's like over over 50 varieties like 50 60 some varieties uh, so, but the ones that we've, uh, narrowed down to like for the assortment that we promote for, for cuts as Syngenta flowers is at like a solid 20, you know, kind okay. of going around the colors, the decorative versus like Daisy types, uh, the, some of the spiders that we have trying to get like a nice range. So there's, there's tons of options cause they all, they all seem to work. Well, I know that from talking with, um, uh, the girls at Harvest Harmony that they were really talking about like a early, mid, and late season blooming. Um, I know that depending where you are, that can be a wide range of dates a little bit, which is one way to extend the season. I'm kind of curious for some areas where it feels like all of these months kind of bloom in this narrow window. Is there any post-harvest techniques for like 
I mean, they have such a long shelf life. I mean, there's so many moms that are stored dry packed in a box, shipped to us, and, and they, they're in a box for sometimes, I don't even know, 10 days maybe before they actually get rehydrated and voila, you know, open up. Is, is there anything that you've seen or research done on this side of it like there are with other flowers? Yeah, so... um so yeah, there's, there are definitely those like early, mid and late actual flowering times, which is a good way to kind of, you know, extend your harvest season. Cause they do, I mean, when you have a whole crop of, you know, one variety, they don't just like flower here and there, like, like zinnias do, you know, they just kind of cut and right. come again. These are going to come on and there they are like all at once. So you're harvesting, you know, the whole plot of them at a time. Um, and we do have uh, specific recommendations for the stage of harvest for mums because okay. you don't want to harvest them I mean you can harvest them more more open for you know for putting into bouquets you know drawing attention at retail you know where you need more of an open product for that eye catchiness of it but if you are planning on cutting it storing it to have it for later uh, the proper the proper harvest stage is 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 really needed and um and then using the right post-harvest solutions. So mums really uh, enjoy floral preservatives with sugars in the water. So any of the uh, holding solutions, so there's hydrators that you would use first that help with like facilitate water uptake and rehydration. So that's something I would suggest using if you were dry storing and you wanna get, you wanna get them to take up water faster after that, recut, put them in hydrator. Um, but the holding solutions with sugars are going to uh, help keep the leaf quality good because, you know, the leaves need those sugars and carbohydrates to stay green, um, but then also help the flowers continue to open because mm. when you cut them in a more closed stage, they need that energy from that holding solution to, to keep them going since they don't have roots anymore. So yeah. that's where the sugars come in. So a lot of growers use the, um, the, the, uh, the Chrysol, the CV, CVBN tablets that are just like slow release chlorine, which are great for keeping bacteria out of the water. We we'll love those, but they don't have a sugar in them. So, you know, keep that in mind for flowers. You want to use a holding solution in addition to like the chlorine tablets um, to help the sugar get into the stems to promote right. opening. No, that makes perfect sense. Well, what stage do you recommend? them cut them at because you know when you have especially so many flowers on one stem how do you you know measure that yeah so so a lot of a lot of this research like um and the recommendations from this uh align really well with uh when pot mums are are shipped so uh you know pot mums these were bred for flower longevity you know because usually they go into a grocery store or a floor shop and, you know, they're there for a little while until, well, they're shipped and they're there for a little while until they're bought. And then you want the consumer to have, you know, longevity in their flowers too. So we recommend um, harvesting the flowers when they're about half open. So from like the stem and the actual, um, yeah, when like half of the flowers on that stem are open. So you won't see full floriferousness but, but half of it. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, I mean, I know that sometimes people get, you know, it, it happens a lot where, you know, you get really excited and you're like, Oh, I want to start cutting these now. And it's kind of like, okay, well you might lose some of that wow factor by jumping the gun. And that's why I was curious about that. Yeah. Cause if you, and if you harvest them like too soon, like then you're really risking the color vibrancy. And if, like all the buds will open even with the best of the best holding solutions. So yeah, half is half is the recommendation. Okay. Do, um, have you guys done any tests with regard to dry packing? We haven't specifically, but I know just just because of how popular chrysanthemums are in the world, there's been a lot of research done on it. So okay. I don't, I wouldn't expect these to honestly be any different from in, in their dry storage capability mm -hmm. than, 
than what's already out there. Right. So right now it's like, uh, let me say that again. Um, right now being that it's the first part of June and I kind of feel like there's this crunch that if you don't have moms, a lot of people are probably already sold out of moms, but if you're wanting to do, to try this, um, when is the actual kind of, uh, I don't know, last, last kind of date that you can actually do something and still have good production this year? Because I know that you can plant later, but then doesn't that impact stem length? The it later does. you get. So then that, and so if stem length isn't the issue, then maybe you can fudge a little bit more, but then you also have those frost dates that are pushing on the back door. So. Yeah. So I, I, hmm. And this is where, like, I want to do that trial with Andrea to where we have a little bit later date because I want to see how how much it affects the number of nodes, you know, and the stem length that they get. But just from, like, a gut feeling, I think you could even wait until, like, two or even three more weeks from now to stick cuttings. So I, I think there's definitely some... So we're in June. Yeah, we're at the beginning of June. I think you could wait until the end of the month to still stick cuttings and have a, de a really decent crop. Wow, that's impressive. I mean, that's, that, you know, because at this point, a lot of us, a lot of our spring things are starting to wind down. Not that we have a lot of extra time on our hands, but um, I know that there is... Um, sort of maybe a window of time. Uh, mm -hmm. I would think though, what has been the effect of all the heat? Because I'm like, we're, I can't believe it, but we're going to hit 90 already here today. Um, and here it is, you know, the first part of June. Uh, do moms, are, are they stunted or stressed at all by the heat? I I didn't see that at all with the with the trials at, at Andrea's, you know, and she's in zone 7B, you know, in uh, like Manassas, Virginia. And so, you know, nice mid-Atlantic uh, heat and humidity. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and no, we didn't, they were just, they were bodacious and healthy. And, you know, I think um, having them in the high tunnel with the ends open um, for like a little bit of that diffused light, you know, from the plastic over helps kind of cut down some of the, the, the high temperatures, but they, they didn't, um, they didn't really sweat it. So they were, they were good. So I, we'll learn more, you know, over these years as more and more growers, um, you know, uh, adopt these genetics for their production and, and then I can learn something from them. There you go. Yeah. I love that. And, uh, as far as pest pressures and things like that, a lot of times people wonder like what, uh, you know, when they're introducing something new, what should they expect? Is there a lot of pest pressures? Cause there aren't, I mean, a lot of, or I know they're like pyrethrins and things like that are kind of come from, if I recall correctly, isn't, I think that's part of this family of, of mums, we'll just say is that's in a lot of organics. Uh, and I'm curious if that helps them fight off things or how that works. Yeah. So they're, they're generally pretty like stress free, free crops when it comes to, um, to pests and diseases. Uh, but you know, just kind of depending on where you are and what known pests you you have um, already on your farm or, you know, other crops that you have that are maybe more prone to certain kind of pests and diseases. Um, it's always good to to watch out for like the main culprits of of bugs on on flower farms. So you always got to watch out for aphids, uh, leaf miners, spider mites, and of course, thrips. So uh Whatever preventive techniques that you're using for those, which are super common, um, will also protect your your mums. So they're lush and robust plants. So I can imagine that they will um, look tasty to to a lot of things, but they're they're not necessarily going to, you know, bring more than than what's already already around. Right, and it's pretty basic, I think. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, I'm excited about all the moms. Um, and again, I want to stress that if you're interested in learning more about how to get some of these, 
you know, you want to you want to reach out to companies like Farmer Bailey. I think you mentioned Ball. I think you know, there's a mm-hmm. lot of people. Um, some of them may be sold out for the year, but there may be some varieties still available that you can try sure. that might uh, be a fun way to just sort of experiment and just to try a few and see what happens. Um, I, I know that there will be more and more and more of these that get introduced over the years. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, which is not related to moms necessarily, unless you, unless there's some stuff there. Um, I know we were recently talking and you were in California at the new trials and I'm kind of curious, first of all, maybe what's new coming down the pipeline, maybe for next year or even for this year. I know we mentioned a couple of things that I was super stoked about and uh, I wanted to give you a chance to kind of share some of the exciting newbies that are coming down the pipeline. Yeah. So yeah. And this is like one of my, the favorite parts of, of my job that, that I have, especially like working um, as part of a breeding company. Cause like I said, we're like trying to come out with the newest, latest and greatest stuff. So every year I get to see beautiful things come out of our breeding pipeline that, you know, could have huge potential in the industry, but for various reasons, you know, they get launched or they don't, you know, there's, you know, different uh, kind of a checklist we go through to before something gets gets to become a new introduction to the world. Um, and uh, this year, uh, we we confirmed in the, you know, a couple of weeks ago that we will have a new Karma Dahlia. Um, so yeah, so adding more to, to our Dahlia assortment. Um, it's this beautiful coral pink color that, and it has a little bit of, it's like, pink dahlias are so dynamic i don't know how you even like can really describe the colors but it's like pink and yellow and then like the underside of the petal is like a little bit purple and so like no matter what angle it's a unicorn from i know right like it looks (laughs) amazing so um we're we're naming that the, the karma series is a mix of like karma and then like uh women's names or uh, drinks. So we have like sangria and we have Cabernet. Um, and then we have, you know, Irene and Amanda, and this one's going to be Karma Caroline. So it's actually named after my daughter who likes rainbows and unicorns. So it's funny that you said it's like the, a unicorn Dahlia. So it'll be oh, Karma wow. Caroline. So really excited to to introduce that. Well, I'm super excited about that. I can't wait to see it. So that's yeah. going to be fun. So like when you say it's being introduced, does that mean it's it's available for 2024 or is it, what what does that mean exactly? Now right. that everyone's so, excited. Yeah. So it's going to be a, um, a launch for the 2024 growing season. So here we'll start doing, um, start promoting our, our new varieties um, at the end of this year. So like we still have a field season, like a summer season to go through sure. before we're like officially, officially official. Um, but we this is like the short list that we've we've decided on for um uh for for next year. So it'll be for the the 24. You can start buying it in the fall of this year for growing in 2024. Wow. Well, that's exciting. What else? Um, well, we're also uh you know, Syngenta flowers, we bred the Sunfinity sunflower, which is the only sunflower, annual sunflower from seed that is truly like branching and reblooming. So we always have a really cool pipeline of sunflower and helianthus genetics um, in our pipeline. And we have some really, uh, really great vegetative varieties. So ones from uh, from cuttings rather than seed. Uh, that's our lingo. We either say it's from seed or vegetative. So, um, uh, okay. You kind of blew my mind. Sunflower cuttings. I'm like, okay. Right. Like, right? um, is, is that just me or does that seem kind of like not normal? I mean, it's definitely not the norm. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, we hear about it more in like the bedding plant and like more perennial, like right. sunflower, you know, world, right. but not necessarily in cuts. So, um, yeah, we've got some, we're not totally sure on launch yet, but we've got some cool stuff with like interesting patterns and highly productive and 
yeah, just some cool stuff. But I can't, I can't okay, tell so all the details. Okay, you're teasing us now. But, yeah. Okay. But it's, it's really exciting. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> what about, okay, so I wanted you to share about Xenia's because Ooh. I was super stoked about this when you told me about it. Yes. So with the Zinnia, so we've had um, uproar rows in our assortment for a very long time. Um, it was an ASCFG Cut Flower of the Year winner in 2009. And ever since we launched it, we've only had the one color in, in uproar. And that was even well before my time with Syngenta. Um, but uh, I was doing some poking around with the breeder. So that's a fun thing too. I get to actually like interact with the breeders and like pick their brains on stuff. And oh, um, cool. the breeders, Todd Perkins, he's a genius. Um, and he actually had some colors of additional colors of uproar kind of in, in the seed vault. So I was like, Ooh, what? I was like, yeah, I was like, can we open the seed vault here and kind of see what, what we can do? Um, and so, so we did, and that was fun. And we trial them, <laughs> and they're amazing. We, there's a uh, why Scarlet. would you keep them in a vault? I, I mean, what? that's like the number one question I hear. Like, I wish there was another, for you know, another color of this series, and because it was such a great performer. I know Scott, and it's it's one of those things, and that's another one of the kind of the nuances of like breeding companies is, I mean, especially you know, we all we have priorities and we have um there's so many different customers and so many different species like we we have over 2000 unique varieties of flowers from like bedding plants you know perennials cut flowers everything that we offer in our assortment 2000 varieties wow so unfortunately it was just a matter of prioritization and so but since we started reviving our cut flower program um yeah we pulled them out of the vault. So, um, uh, so we have a scarlet and a deep yellow that we also trialed with the ASCFG in their annual seed trial last season. And it got really great feedback that it was just like uproar rose and, um, yeah, just big double, like sturdy, productive, just every, everything that folks love about uproar. And so we were actually, um, to, kind of do a limited edition pre-launch sneak peek of those new varieties. Um, so if if people are looking for those, you can actually get them through Express Seed Company and you can get them through Ball, through Ball Hort. So they have some of our seed supply of, of Uproar. So it's kind of a limited, limited edition um, you know, small number of seed. It's a limited stock uh, from a test production that we did. So, um, but we're hoping to do a full launch in in a, f a couple, a few more years once we can build up all the seed in the bags to to get to everybody. So, well, that's yeah. the thing that people don't realize that are maybe asking that question is the amount of capital that goes into one hybrid, one cultivar just to get either the production to get the purity the the cleanliness you know no virus no disease to get the volume of seed that is required for the demand you you don't want to launch just kind of halfway because then you end up upsetting more people than you made happy and anyway i know yeah. it's a whole oh, it's yeah. a whole thing yes whole it is thing. no and i'm glad you mentioned that because sometimes we get a a lot of times we get a lot of flack for that, you know, like, well, why don't you just have more seed? And it's like, well, whew, like you got to have, especially for hybrids, you have to have the parents, you have to have the parent seed produced to have enough to cross, to make the actual F1 hybrid variety like uproar um, to get. And then, yeah, we have to uh, grow the seed. So we have to do hand pollinations or sometimes with, with, uh, um, insects to do the pollinations and then you've got to wait for the seed to mature you got to harvest the seed you got to clean the seed uh sometimes the seed needs to be coated then it has to be germ tested because that's another mm. part of the quality of things we want to make sure it actually germinates for you guys so we want to make sure we're sending out quality batches and all of that takes an inordinate amount of time <laughs> yeah time and money yes. um and i know that that's that that's sometimes where 
it's hard because it's kind of like, okay, well, this is a great idea, but we need cash flow. So we've we got to put this energy behind these betting plans right now. But that's yes. why I'm thrilled that you're there because now you feel like there's, there's somebody in our corner that is cheerleading the cut flower production side or the research and development there. And um, I'm especially excited for North America uh, because, I, you know, there's a lot of these things that have been um, the capital expenditures have been purposefully placed in other countries or continents um, because it's closer to where the majority of the, the plants are sold and produced. But um, hopefully the more people that are growing and buying mums or whatever the, you know, uproar zinnias, whatever that, you know, whatever that is, then it, get, it wakes up the, the, the corporate entities to say, oh, we need to pay attention to this because, hello, there's a lot of people out there growing flowers again. Absolutely. Absolutely. That demand abs drives our R&D programs and our priorities. So yeah, if we're getting the demand from a certain species, a certain you know segment of the industry, and they're pulling that, that's where we're going to put our R and D dollars and focus into. So you're absolutely right, Scott. Yep. Hmm. Well, I always like to ask an advice question, and I don't know if I prepared you for this or not, but uh, that uh, makes it more fun sometimes. But um, I, you know, for our flower farmers or florists out there, for everybody that's listening, you know, it can be something that's just personal that maybe means a lot to you or something you'd like to share with our listeners. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I guess one of the things would be just to to really do understand the breeder behind the genetics that you're growing or like just really understand the variety that you're growing because I didn't fully appreciate that like even when I was on Andrea's farm, like I right. I didn't I didn't understand everything that went into that zinnia that I was growing or that dahlia or, you know, that hydrangea. Um, and there's so much information out there that, that we breeders put out there for your use. So like go to our websites, we have full culture guides, we have videos, we have information, you know, there's people like me that are out there to help support you, um, uh, you know, to be successful. And there's just so much information and a lot of it can be variety dependent, you know, cause like I said, we're, right. we are breeding specifically for innovation, for improvement, for certain qualities. And when you really understand what something you're growing was bred for, that's where you get the best quality product. You're really tapping in the into the potential of it. So just, yeah that takes you to the next level. When you understand your varieties and you know the breeder and the people behind it, like that's, yeah, that would be my advice. And that I'm really thankful that you shared that because there are so many resources out there now. I know that you created um, a blog post with Farmer Bailey in all of his guides. I know that you just, like you said, Syngenta has all of these resources available. Yeah. And we're going to make sure that if you go to theflowerpodcast.com on, on Allison's episode, that we're going to put links to some things to make it easy for people to find stuff um just by visiting our website so i i appreciate you sharing that because you know we don't have to always figure it all out on our own do we no you don't we're we're at least trying to get you like halfway there you know i mean we can't just like all the the environmental conditions and stuff you know we were talking about earlier you can't know everything but we can we can get you halfway there i'm confident with saying that yeah, yeah, I think probably more than halfway, actually. You're just being modest. Well, uh, Allison, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everything you do to champion cut flowers. And thank you for being on the Flower Podcast. Yeah, no, thank you. This was awesome. I This was a, an awesome opportunity. And uh, it was, 
uh, great to talk with you. And I hope that uh, the listeners, you know, got some nice tidbits out of, uh, out of this to help them be the most successful at whatever they do. So appreciate it. Thank you.